We just stepped on their face with a hobnail boot and broke their nose. Fucking dogs. That's what I told them. Hope it doesn't take that long again. Go dogs. Everybody. Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 100 Sanford Podcast. We are back in the building. It's Lovelace. It's Foss. What's going on, Foss? None of the dogs still undefeated. See, I got the championship here. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, vic- vic- victory! Yeah, you know I got saying? the old school yeah, joint yeah, on. There you go. You got you know you know <laughs> that's how we do. We just we just printing championship shirts now. <laughs> you know what I mean? I should I should have tried to get one when I was you know we'll get it to where I was this you know yesterday. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, and uh, but yeah, man, it's good. I'm 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 alive and well. You know, healthy. How you feeling, man? You got the I know I know you're working on the body. I'm, I'm, I took the same still, advice. Still, I'm taking still, it from you. I'm still still doing it. It's tough because I do want some brownies and <laughs> cookies and all that type of stuff. But you know, it's working out. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, make you feel good. You know, you know, drop I ain't gonna lie. Pounds, drop, dropping some pounds. Yeah. I ain't gonna lie, bro. I mean, I cut out all the sugar. My body feels a lot better. And you know I got the herniated disc, man. But honestly, like, my body yeah, feels the infl- better. The, infl- the, the inflammation goes down, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it goes it's, down. It's, it's different, man. My knees don't really hurt. Like, it's, it makes a difference, man. It's just hard. We just addicted to that stuff, man. That stuff. Yeah. And they, they are like it. They liking that stuff to, you know, like, you know, hardcore drugs. Yeah, it's like crack. You know I mean? you got, it yeah. keeps you coming yeah. back, man. You know, and they talk mm-hmm. about the – the additives like, in it and that's, the preservatives. That's what keeps you coming back to it, man. There's something in that. There's something in those chemicals that keep you coming mm-hmm. back, man. So, um, yeah. but I'm glad yeah. I took your advice. Um, drinking a lot of, I'm drinking a ton of water. Drinking yeah. a ton of that. That's big too. I need to get back on that. Not that I don't, not that I'm drinking something else. It's just not drinking period. So that means I'm not getting as much water as I want to, but I've been, I've been the last few days though, because um, I don't know if you got that far into the, uh, the <laughs> reading for that thing. There's yeah. there, there's fasts that go yes. along with this program. You yes, know what I mean? Are. And you know, hey, everybody different. Like you don't like if you ain't did the fast, that's cool. You know what I'm saying? It ain't like. You ain't gonna get no spanker to that. <laughs> like we grow, we we grow old folks. You know what I mean? We fall right. off, we do whatever. But yeah, I had we had water fast was Wednesday this week, and then last week the previous two weeks were uh, fruit fast on Wednesday. You know what right. I'm saying? So me, 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 I choose. I get about four or five big ap- biggest apples I can find. <laughs> right, and uh, that's be my fruit fast for the for the Wednesday. Been on. It's been good, man. You know what's yeah. going on? What's going on with Mr. Love Lace? Man, I, t- I tell you what, I had to take a couple days off the joint because uh, I got a sinus infection, man. I got a, got it real bad. So I was sitting there, couldn't breathe, couldn't really, you know, couldn't mm-hmm. hold anything down really. So I had to switch it up a little bit. So, but I still kept all the sugars out and all that kind of stuff. But um, mm-hmm. so my body's feeling better. I'm feeling better. Um, my son, he's getting ready to get into the football season, at least the flag football I season. I see my man workouts. Yeah, he's working. He, he got he, his feet real nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I see you got him out there. Who set up the drills? You set up the drills? Yeah, man. I, I contact a bunch of different people, man. I, I stay in contact. His cousin plays for the University of Pittsburgh, Braylon Lovelace. Okay. So he's a freshman this year. Nice. Uh, his other younger cousin is on one of the top – 13 and under teams, they actually just went down to Texas, man, and went, I think they finished second or third in the state of Texas for their 13 and under, but they got a bunch of dogs. And uh, But he's up in Pittsburgh, so I get a bunch of drills from them. And he actually works out at the same spot that Aaron Donald's at, two tenths in Pittsburgh. Okay. So uh, so we get a lot of drills there. But then, um, you know, he, he he gets motivated, man. So I was, yeah. I was texting back and forth with Doogie. You know our boy Doogie that mm-hmm. was on the show. Yeah. Uh, freshman for University of Georgia, and I said, "Hey, big, man, big Doogie, big Doogie, is Big Doogie uh, there already?" Yeah, he's there. He's there. Okay, okay, yeah, he's there. Yeah, so I reached yeah. out to him, and then he was like, "Say, hey, you know, tell little man good luck on the season, and everything else." So I sh- I showed Landon the picture and showed him the the text, 
And he's like, come on, let's go work out. So he gets motivated, man. I keep trying to that's, tell that's a, that's a big, student that's, athletes. It means a lot when somebody says something, you know, they get motivated. It's a big time thing, man. Like the earlier you can get, man, like I, I was a late bloomer, man. We didn't, mm-hmm. didn't, we didn't have, first of all, you had no money for all that <laughs> Camp, camps right. and, you know, then, you know, just, you know, my first real thing with, you know, uh, I always loved football. Uh, but my first real experience was, you know, middle school. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, I never went to a camp or none of that stuff. You know what I mean? So, and, you know, it ended up working out for me just from natural ability. But, like, these kids that get started as young as your son are, man, they, like, I, I wouldn't have known how to do ladder drills at, at that age. Right, right. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like, he's going he's gonna to be ahead of the curve, man. It's going to be interesting to see his, you know, progression over the years, man. Well, yeah, you know, that's what his cousin was telling him because I guess he was getting instruction from some of the Penn State coaches because he's being recruited already by, like, Ohio State, Pitt, Penn State, Maryland, that sort of thing. And they were like, look, you don't, have to, you don't even have to play tackle football until a certain age now. It's, it's, about, it's about footwork, agility, hand-eye coordination, you know, natural strength, and, you know, some light weights until you get to a certain uh, level. So that's where no he's question. at now. I, you know, I'm always – I'm I'm old school, you know, I'm mm-hmm. still old school, but I have taken into account and weighed the pros and cons of the changes in football. Mm-hmm. And and as much as old school I am as I am and as much as I love the the physicality and the the the, the brutalness, brutality <laughs> yeah of it all, I understand the changes now and I'm on board, and I definitely don't think kids. You know, I'm not saying I wouldn't watch it. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, go to the park and watch everything. Yeah, but I don't think it's a necessity to get what you want out of the game. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's a necessity to play tackle football till you're 11. You know, yeah. 12. You know, middle yeah. school. You know, my my first time playing tackle football was in middle school. Well. Outside of the hood. Now we used to we used to knock each other block off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the hood. I, don't, I think there might have been more dangerous to play attack football at the park, uh, <laughs> right? The, for, for the uh, for the league, but you know, but like organized tackle football. I didn't play the middle school. You know what I mean? And, and it it worked out. It worked out fine. Yeah, his best friend, he actually went to hit one of his games, and he's playing tackle. He's nine years old, and they were asking. Coach came over. He's like, "Hey, you know, your boy want to come out and play." And I'm like, nah, man, he ain't coming out until at least 11 or 12 years old. Now, my son, he was disappointed because he saw the pads, you know what I mean? He saw the gear, and they, yeah. they had no you know, nice gear and all and, that kind and, of stuff. And it's different. It if, you, if, you, if you, it's not worth it, and you got to know who coaching your kids. I saw some Facts. videos the other day, and, man, they got these kids doing straight up Oklahoma with no technique, you know what I mean? Kids mm-hmm. getting knocked out the box. Like, I'm talking about kids getting like, – like, some of these kids are – you know, more advanced than other kids. Mm-hmm. You know, you got some seven year olds that are not your seven year your seven year old in the exactly. Dirt. You exactly. know what I mean? Because they they just built different, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and it ain't it ain't worth it at that age. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And and the, and the coach is letting it fly. You know, right. they think they right. think it's cool. They think it's cool, and it ain't cool for kids to be taking them type of shots at that age. So yeah, you know what I mean? If you if if you absolutely Feel like your kid can play tackle. Know what know what coach you're sending them to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I gotta know what coach you're sending them to. Yeah, that's what I told him, man. You know, I, he wants to do it, and I said, nah. And plus, he's a little light in the butt right now. I mean, mm-hmm. physically, he's like the type of kid he going he's gonna try to knock you out. But it's like, mm-hmm. all right, but you ain't ready to try to knock anybody out mm-hmm. yet at your at your size. But I mean, he's so fast mm-hmm. and quick. You know, he's, he's going to miss a few shots just because of his speed, you know, and his technique and that sort of thing. But still, at the same time, it's not worth it at this point. You know, learn everything you're supposed to learn. Learn more about the game so that the game comes faster mm-hmm. to you anyway than most kids mm-hmm. are just out there just throwing their body around. But, uh, but yeah, that's all I'm, I'm doing now, man. He's getting ready for that this weekend and, uh, you know, just got done watching the combine stuff and, 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 and watching Pro Day. But mm-hmm. before we get into it, you know, we got to pay a few bills. You know, I want everybody to make sure they head on over to vacay, vacay, take a vacay.com, T A K E A V A Y C A Y dot com. 
Vacay is got premium products, man. They got the edibles, they got the gummies, they got the vapes, they got everything that's gonna make you feel good and relax. I took one of the sleep uh, gummies the other day, man. I was out, bro. I, I, <laughs> I woke up so good, I didn't know what to do. That, that was Listen, one of the best Delta, sleeps I ever had. Delta Delta will put you down. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yes, Delta sir. Will put you down. If you need some sleep, Delta is that Delta A, Delta Nine, all, all that stuff. That's that's up your alley if you're trying to sleep. I tell you that much. It was a good sleep, man. So I, I mean, I, I can tell everybody right now that VK does work. Use the promo code 100 Sanford for 10 percent off on all your products. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. But uh, back to the game, back to football, back to Georgia. We had the NFL Combine. Some good results came out of there. Some mixed results came out of there, obviously, uh, with Jalen Carter's situation. But then we hit on over to Athens, where you were just at. We had Georgia's Pro Day. What was it like for you, man? I know we got a special guest coming on soon who's going to talk a little bit more about it. But what was uh, G-Day uh, – not G-Day. What was uh, Pro Day for uh, like for you? Uh, it was just good to be back on campus, man. Like it, every time I'm there, man, I see something new. <laughs> like it's, it's, <laughs> that place, that place is just expanding, and you know they're adding to what's making them great. And the two-time back-to-back national championships, like world-class facilities, mm-hmm. and all of that. So it was good to see that, and and good to get back and see guys that I knew on the on the scouting trail. You know, when, during my days as a scout. Um, um, NFL scout. Um, I uh, got to see a lot of guys that I, uh, a couple guys that I worked alongside, a couple guys that I would see at games, uh, doing advanced scouting reports and, and at combines and stuff like that. And, uh, good to see, you know, old players that still work at the school, like Jonas Jennings and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I, I got to uh, chop it up with Bobo a little bit. I, t- I, t- I told him, I told him, man, I, I, on the drive up there, uh, I was, you know, I, I had a little chuckle with myself remembering him, and uh, it, it's it's crazy how time flew. You know, yeah. what I mean, like uh, like Kirby. I played with Kirby, but I missed Bobo by a year. But both of them came back. And were our GAs, and so they like they used to check for curfew uh, every night. So it, <laughs> they, you know they they were fresh out of college still. So it used to be funny, you know what I mean. It used right. to be funny, um, just them coming by checking. You know we ain't we us not wanting to be there. We 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 you know we you know giving them hell <laughs> checking on the doors <laughs> and stuff. And right. now they big they big time college coaches. Both of them been head coaches. You know, now they back in the mix together. And uh, you know, uh I'm looking forward to seeing what Bobo's gonna do, man. I think he's I think he's gonna sh- show some people and prove some people wrong, man. Because there's a lot of naysayers out there. I know he knows. I know he's heard it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I, I, I know he's ready to uh get back to it. I, I know he's putting in the work. I know, you know, talking to my boy Jonas, he's like over there talking to him and Bobo. He said, man, Bobo used to come by and hug me every day and say, what's up? He said, now you can't find Bobo. He in the lab. That's what's <laughs> up. I mean, but you know what? Quite honestly, that's what that's what fans want to hear. Because when you do hear about the, the naysayers about Bobo, I mean, it, it's – it goes back to his previous days when he's at Georgia, but there's a lot of things that you can learn in your time in, in, in various stops, you know, mm-hmm. being a head coach, mm-hmm. understanding the, understanding the game much more coming back to Georgia, learning under Kirby, who's learned the game much, much, much more under uh, Nick Saban, you know what I mean? And then learning under Todd Munkin, who obviously was doing it at a high level at Georgia, but Todd Munkin could always dial up plays. He could always do what he had to do. He just had an unbelievable cast of guys that he could do it with, which made him even better. So, you know, shout out to him as he's going to the uh, Baltimore Ravens. I'm sure he's going to do big time things, but you can only learn from a guy like that. And I think with Bobo, he he's going to learn and he's going to adapt to what he has learned to make this offense just as explosive as it always was more explosive than it was back in the day when he was coaching. And 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 I think people are going to be pleasantly surprised by what they see. At the same time, having a defense that's going, you know, keep teams off the field, keep mm-hmm. offense uh, scores down. You don't have to outscore anybody, outgun anybody for the most part. And you can allow things to just come to you. So 
I'm excited for it. I mean, obviously nobody wanted Munkin to leave because he was doing it at such a high level, but I'm excited for the for the upcoming season and upcoming things that are going to happen. A change from Stetson Bennett to a new quarterback, a, a, a change in the backfield. You know, one of the yeah. biggest tight ends in the history of the game is gone. I mean, there's a lot of things that are going to change, but some things still stay the same, and that's Kirby. I got a chance to talk to talk to B Mac. You know, he was he was a youngster when I was leaving. Uh, Brian McClendon is yeah. there now. He, you know, asked about his room. He loves his room. You know, what I mean, the backs are going to be ready to go. Mm-hmm. Um, I got to see him and uh, uh, finally uh, got me some. A little, I got finally got to get me a little bit of gear. You know, talk to my boy Mishad <laughs> up there. Uh, had a few shirts for me. I hadn't gotten nothing from this school in a long time. I was like, "Hey man, <laughs> any any up, any up." You know what I'm saying? So that that was good. And uh, uh, also, um, uh, actually, uh, it's funny. I talked. I saw the other day um, this clip of. I don't know if it's uh, Big Ben has a podcast or whose podcast was, but it was Ben and uh and Tomlin on there. Mm-hmm. Saw some clips and they were talking about this football league called A seven, and that is my jam. Like <laughs> and, and like I was like I was like I knew I I knew I liked you, Mike T. You know what <laughs> I mean, Mike T. He brought it up on the podcast. Like I think not many people know about A seven. It's tackle football, no pads, no helmets. Mm-hmm. And they got they got announcers and everything, and there's some talented dudes out there, man. That you know, just for ever whatever reason, you know, life didn't give them. You know, I'm pretty sure some of those guys played college because some of those guys are just too phenomenal of athletes. Mm-hmm. But you know, for whatever for whatever reason, they didn't go to the next level after that or whatever. And uh, they played this this little league called A7, and he was so enamored with it. <laughs> And he was talking, he was on the podcast, he was talking about it. And you can see the smile on his face, man. He was, he was pretty much advocating for it. And so I walked up to him, I said, man, me and you see eye to eye on this one thing. I said, I saw you talking about A7 and he lit up. Like we, just, we, 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 we had a nice little quick conversation about A7 football. Y'all check that out, man. If you're listening right now, look up A7. Uh, it's, 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 it's a football league with a, like I say, no pads, no helmet, tackle football, uh, and like the the announcers are hilarious. Um, <laughs> and so, like the Rucker, is it like the Rucker? Uh, yes, it's essentially because you know some of those guys, you know, a lot of the teams are are, are northern, so you yeah. get the, uh, the you get the uh, the announcers with the with the with the up north lingo, you know, right, accent, right. you know what I mean. But it's 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 real cool, man. Um, you can find them on Instagram too. Just check, check. That's the best way to get the highlights. Just go on their IG page, man. Yeah, A seven is dope. But yeah, man, got to talk to Kirby. You know, I think I post some pictures on the um one hundred Sanford. Uh, Did he say he was coming on the show? Is he is he going to break <laughs> protocol? I, 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 I didn't ask him. I, 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 I almost brought it up. You know what I'm saying? But I, I don't think I don't think he going to break protocol anytime soon. Uh, it, you know, it'd be it. it It'd be it'd be kind of hypocritical for him to break protocol and nobody else can. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But you know, <laughs> yeah, y'all know man. y'all know what Kirby owes us. That's all I'm gonna say. He owes us. <laughs> we know the hosts know what Kirby owes us for. But that's you know, I understand. Yeah, we gotta talk to him a little <laughs> bit. Um, I was like, I had to congratulate him. I said, I hadn't seen you, you know, since you know, since uh, the game. What he was like? Yes, I did. He was like, I, I saw you at the game. He said, you stuck out like a sore thumb. <laughs> said, I, I, That's right. And I, 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 got sent, I got sent pictures. And, I, yes, I did look like a giant <laughs> sitting, sitting on that front row. So, yeah, he, he, so he did see me. But I had a chance to congratulate him in person, man. I don't think, any, I don't think people – like, I hope we don't get so jaded that we think that it's just automatic like that because I don't think people mm. understand how truly great a feat that was. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. yes, uh, to go for one to go back to back and two to go back to back with two completely different, you know, styles, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, they, they lost a lot of players, a lot of talent from the championship before. And to do it again with all those new, fresh faces, fresh faces that had to learn, 
on mm-hmm. the fly. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> like you like you like your uh Starks and your uh Michael and those guys like that that played, you know, a lot of ball. You Dylan know, Bell. Man. Yeah. Dylan Bell, like man, I I'm not sure what I would have done as a freshman. <laughs> you know, you know it's, especially know on that, 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 that that red shirt was warranted. <laughs> 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 well, I'll tell you what, real quick, I know you were talking about Mike T. Uh, that podcast with Big Ben is uh, footballing. So, yeah, he, he does have his own podcast. And I think Ben does it out of the, out of his basement. It looks like a basement. Well, his, well, let's basement for us. His man cave is about the size of everybody else's house. That's, house, that's what right. I mean, but that's a great show that Ben has. But, you know, I was going to ask you because I saw the one video that you posted or you sent to me, too. It was the panoramic. That's the one that yeah. I want, man, where you were showing everything that was going on, kind of like you were either at the end of the uh, practice facility or like right in the middle of the field. But how yeah. many people were there, man? I know all 32 teams were represented because obviously a lot of talent. But yeah. I'll ask you this before we ask our guests coming on soon. Did anything stand out to you where, I don't know, maybe even a scout or a coach or a GM kind of tipped their hand because they were so enamored by a certain talent. Because I think nah. I saw one. Well, you may maybe if you if you zeroed in, you know, you probably will see some. But man, me, I was just all over the place, taking it in and you know talking to different people, and uh, everybody's gonna have the same reactions about everything. Like right. like it, everybody should be. There are nuances here and there, but everybody's gonna be. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, on the same page about elite athletes. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. The, the, ooh, the oohs and ahs are going to come, you know, are going to come honest. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Everybody's going to have the same same reaction. So, you know, like if you see a, a, a dude that's, that's, a, that's a stud, everybody knows he's a stud. <laughs> you know what I mean? You see Jalen Carter going through them bags and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's gonna be oppressive to everybody, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what I mean. So, yeah, but I don't I don't know anybody tip their hands, and they definitely not gonna say nothing. You know what I mean. I might have got asked before, hey, do you know any of these kids? And you know, I don't know, I don't know these guys. You know, like right. that. I'm watching just like you. Yeah, there was a there was a moment where they showed Nolan. Now, obviously, he went to the combine, balled out, did what he did. I mean, his mm-hmm. his measurables were off the chart. But there was a moment where they showed him doing his drill. And I don't know who the coach is for Cincinnati, but Cincinnati's already been rumored to, you know, be all in on on uh, on Nolan anyway. The look that he gave, man, was it, it was like seductive. It was like, I, I need this dude. I need I, I mean, I love everything about him. And I could see why. I mean, the kid is Listen, Nolan phenomenal. Nolan good, man. He yeah. looked good, man. I was really impressed. I can't say I'm surprised, but I was really impressed by his band. You know, yeah. going going around the 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 the, the bags and stuff. Uh, he, of course, we know he does everything full speed and with passion. So, um, yeah, I can see why that would be the reaction. <laughs> yeah, and, and which is interesting to me because I'm watching it, and that was one of the questions that a lot of scouts did have was his bend. I mean, they they saw the me- you know the measurables, the speed, the 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 forty, the uh, the vert, all that kind of thing. But it was something, quite honestly, truly, we hadn't even seen at Athens the, the four years that he was here was his bend because they asked him to do so much. And it's going to be yeah. interesting to see him at that next level, how he translates, wh- who's going to take him under what circumstances, whether it's a 4-3, a 3-4. Again, we got a guest coming on soon that we're going to ask about that. But it's going to be interesting because I get questioned all the time. What about Nolan? Do you think he could play here? Do you think he could play there? I Listen, mean, I Steeler think... fans are asking me, can he play the will or play a middle linebacker because of his speed? And we need one. So it's an yeah, interesting he can. He's a guy that, you know, I think Georgia used him how they saw fit, how he needed to play in that system. You know, and those yeah. guys buy in. You know, it may take away from what they may want to do. Right, right. You know what I mean? And what they can do, but you need to play in the system and do what we tell you to do. And nice. and the result, you're going to win. You know what I mean? But I think he has to dip. He has some being. He's explosive. Um, he could um, – there, there have been some guys that, you know, didn't have the sack numbers in 
in college and they ended up having in pros. One comes to mind that I wasn't a huge fan of as a scout. Mm-hmm. And that was Daniel, Daniel Hunter with the um, Minnesota Vikings. Mm-hmm. And he ended, he ended up and, and to his credit and whoever coached him's credit, he ended up being a legit pass rusher uh, on the next level because he had the tools, like the tools were always there. Right. You, know, you saw the, the, the length, the speed, you know, just he looked like the typical pass rusher in, in college. He just didn't have the numbers. Uh, and I see that happening with Nolan, too. Nice, nice. Well, I'll tell you what. We got Graham Coffee that just joined. He joined just in time because we got our guests getting ready to come on. We have Jordan Reed, ESPN draft analyst, who's getting ready to join us. Foss, I'm going to let you introduce him because that's your boy. That's the way y'all rock. That's the way you do things. So I'm going to let you introduce him. But, uh, Graham, what's going on, man? Not much, man. Just uh, working on some of this Jalen Carter story. Spoke to his attorney earlier today. Had some interesting things to say about certain previous reports. And, uh, yeah, interesting stuff, man. Um, feel, Feel bad for Carter and some of the assumptions that have been made about things that happened the night of January 15th that might not necessarily have been true. But uh, mm. we'll probably be publishing something here in the next hour or two uh, at latest tomorrow morning that kind of breaks down what the attorney said and how that contradicts some of the things that came out initially during the NFL combine. Nice, nice. We'll make sure yeah, – Make sure you listen to the show, first of all, always, but always head on over to dogcentral.com. Get that info from Graham. I mean, you got to be behind the paywall to get it sometimes. I mean, sometimes, oh, man, you good. This will be leak out some out little there. tidbits. Yeah. <laughs> this one's <laughs> too important to keep, keep behind the paywall. <laughs> I got you, baby. I'm looking, well, looking forward to reading that. Well, Foss, yeah. we, got our, we got our guests. I'm going to let you do the honors. Do your thing and do what you do. <laughs> hey, hey, today, man, I'm so – Honored to have this guy. I'm glad he uh, he agreed to come on 100 Sanford and grace us with his presence. Uh, this guy, man, I don't remember how we met. I, I, I imagine we probably met online first. I probably knew each other online first, probably on the, in the Twitterverse. And then we eventually met, I believe, down there in, in Mobile for the Senior Bowl one year, some years back. And... Uh, he was with the Draft Network then, uh, doing ex- extensive, great, exemplary work for that um, for that network, uh, which led to him. You know, ESPN had to snatch him up, baby. They had to get him. They had, they, they had they had they had to come get my guy because he he does great work. You know, played the game at a high level. Uh, you, I believe, it was UNCC Central. I don't want to get it wrong. You know, still the still the all time completion percentage leader there. You know, he knows what he's talking about from the quarterback position. I believe he was all MEAC at one at all conference in the MEAC um one year. Uh so we got a guy that's coming on that knows his stuff and he puts in the work. You know, a lot of these pundits they get online and on TV <laughs> and they just spew stuff that they don't know what they're talking about. My guy Jordan knows his stuff. Thank you and welcome Jordan Reed to 100 Sanford. I appreciate it, man. I got a lot to live up to. As that <laughs> <laughs> I feel like uh, I feel like Michael Buffer just introduced me. There. <laughs> <laughs> He's done that before, man, and people just flabbergasted. They're, I mean, they start choking up. They start crying sometimes. I'm, I'm glad it. that you didn't do that. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Stop it, man. Hey, man, I, I, I truly – hey, man, I, I, as you get older, man, our time is very precious. And I know my man has a family. He's got two little girls, man. Uh, I got <laughs> – y- y'all already know what I be up to. I'm, I'm actually – in a different, whole different state about one of my kids right now. Yeah. So I know time is precious. And so I, I appreciate people that choose to come on here, man. I don't take it for granted. Yeah. Well, Jordan, this is Lamar Lovelace, man. I, again, I thank you for coming on the show as well. You're also joined with, by Graham Coffey, who's our other co-host. We want to talk about Georgia. I mean, you're the guy that we wanted to go to. We wanted to talk about our dogs. That's what our fan base wants to listen to. Um, the NFL Combine and Georgia Pro Day. They're over. What are your takeaways from from what you saw 
from this two-time back-to-back national t- championship squad? Well, the first thing I'll say is the facility there is unbelievable. That was my first time actually <laughs> going to the facility. Yeah. I, we had a good talk. Me and Foss had a good talk while guys were running 40s and that. It's just crazy to see from when he was playing to how everything has been built up um, over the past 20 or 25 years or so. So um, just the facilities is unbelievable. But the athletes that were on the field, I was really impressed with a lot of guys. Um, I mean, starting at the top, Jalen Carter was the big story of the day, uh, for Mm -hmm. lack of better terms. But as far as the players that did participate throughout the entirety of it, entirety of it, I should say, I think what Kirby has built, I think these you were really seeing some of the foundational pieces um, with him, whether it was Nolan Smith, who did everything to help himself, Keely Ringo, Broderick Jones, the list goes on and on of some of these players um, that are definitely going to be playing on Sundays and hear their name and called in the first round as well. Well, can we go to the elephant in the room right away? You you mentioned Jalen Carter. You mentioned, you know, his his uh, his workout popped. I was I was watching it live as you were actually broadcasting, talking about it on ESPN. What did you see there that maybe we didn't see as fans um, outside of the view of the camera? I mean, because there's a, there's a lot of reports that he didn't look so good and there's some that said he looked great. What were your thoughts in, uh, in, in watching him perform? Yeah, so when I first got to the facility, I actually walked past Jalen. He was coming in to check in with NFL scouts and everything. And I was like, man, he looks a little bit bigger than what we're normally seeing him as. Because, I mean, Kirby said he played, Coach Smart didn't say it, but he probably played around 305 pounds. Um, If I had to guess, 305, 310 pound range. Um, I saw him play against South Carolina earlier this year. That was my first time actually seeing him up close. And I could tell that he had gained a little bit of weight. And then you hear the reports coming out saying that he gained nine pounds since the combine. So he did look a little bit heavy when I did walk past him. But I can't really speak on that because I don't know what Jalen is going through. I don't know how he's coping with this situation. So I don't want to say anything wrong about that as far as, you know, why he gained the weight. I don't want to call him lazy or anything like that because I don't know exactly what's going on with his head as far as his process and things of that nature. So he does need to get the weight back down and he'll have an opportunity to do that. He still has to go on 30 visits uh, with these teams. So each team is allotted 30 players that they can bring on private visits and private workouts. So he'll still have an opportunity to answer some of the questions that teams still have about him. Um, As far as the workout, he didn't do any testing. He didn't run a 40. He didn't do broad jump. He didn't do vertical. That was his discretion. He chose not to do that. But the positional work, I thought he looked explosive at the beginning. But as the workout went on, you could just tell that his conditioning was going to be an issue. Um, he didn't finish the workout, and they said it was cramping. That that was the biggest reason. That was the reason why he didn't finish the workout. So he still has a little over a month to answer some questions. But, I mean, obviously there was more questions raised uh, with him, with the conditioning levels, and then he has to answer why he gained those nine pounds. But the talent is the talent. I mean, you can turn on the film not having seen Georgia play before and ask questions, who the heck is number 88 because he's making so many plays. So mm-hmm. the talent is, isn't the question. It's just the off-the-field stuff and just his commitment to the process. That's the big question that teams have about him right now. Thanks. Yeah, I feel like that's a fair – that's a fair question for teams to have. Um, I will say this without the, you know, you know, sounding like making it excuses for him. I don't think the the pre draft process uh, is one. Yeah, you're getting ready. You're getting ready to do drills and test well, but I don't know if it's exactly the process to get in shape with it. You know what I mean? A lot of those guys are going to be in shape because, the, you know, the process will get you in some shape. But I don't know how much of it's going to prepare you for rapid fire doing drills alongside linebackers. You know what I mean? He was the only big guy there. Uh, but, yeah, the nine pounds, I uh, imagine that would be uh, – you probably want to know why, you know, as a big guy. I could probably tell you why and how <laughs> it happened. <laughs> you know what I mean? You you traveling and eating and probably dealing with court and charges and all that stuff and yeah. stress. And, you know, uh, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes. And I can tell you now that you can gain uh, – I've seen it happen. <laughs> you can gain nine pounds in a weekend. One, it don't take two weeks. It don't take – 
five days, it can be a weekend, a weekend of eating good. <laughs> Thanks, so, uh, so hopefully he gets all of that under under wraps and um and luckily he gets to answer these questions at top thirty visits because they they definitely gonna put him through the ringer and um he might you know I don't know who's planned on him to do any workouts but he's uh, I'd imagine with all the questions that teams probably have now they probably want to put him through some private workouts you know what I mean so we'll see well let me let me follow that up George and I'm gonna ask Jordan with everything that's going on he's such a phenomenal talent. And I know that you previously had him probably going number one, number two, number three in your own rankings. Where would you have Jalen Carter right now listed as, as, as one of your prospects? Top 10, top 15? What are we talking? If we're just strictly talking about talent, I mean, it's either him or Will Anderson at the top. I think those are your only two blue chip prospects at the top that you just know walking through the door that they're going to be two of the best players in this class as far as at the position. And then we're talking about perennial Pro Bowl type of players as rookies. So that's what I classify as blue chip prospects. And that's what's interesting about this class just because there's not a lot of those blue chip types Last year, you had Sauce Gardner, you know, Derek Stingley, guys you knew walking through the door that, hey, these could be franchise-altering type of players, and Sauce was that for the New York Jets. And I think Jalen and also Will can be those type of players. So that's why I say with Jalen, the talent is a talent. Like, you know, he's arguably the top player in this draft class, but it's just who am I getting as far as off the field? And then when he gets some money in his pocket, like, is he still going to be that same discipline type of guy? Or is he going to be that player where I have to have guidance in the building? And then also, does he need that type of figure um, that's going to be watching him 24-7 too? So you have to do your homework as far as what exactly I'm getting off the field too. Well, I think one of the guys that everybody knows what they're getting off the field, on the field, in the in the classroom, is Nolan Smith. Um, he showed out at the combine. He showed out at pro day. Where now do you evaluate him? Because the production at Georgia is much like Walker was last year. You don't see the production that everybody prototypically sees out of a guy drafted that high. Where would you have Nolan Smith in terms of what you've seen on film and then you know, in these workouts as well. I would be really surprised if he didn't go inside of the top 20, as long as the medicals check out with the pec. It was unfortunate that he get, didn't get to finish the season, but I got an opportunity to have a really good talk with Nolan following the workout when a lot of people had exited in the building. And you can just tell, like, the personality is off of the charts, the infectious energy that he has, and just his love for the game. Like, he checks all those boxes. And then the athletic profile was ridiculous. We saw it at the combine, him running 4-3-9 at his size. It was great. And I told him, like, the player that you're going to be compared to is Hassan Reddick as far as hmm. you know, height, weight, size, ability, and then what you can be on the next level. Everybody sees Hassan Reddick in him just because walking through the door, he's going to be a problem as a pass rusher just because the way he's able to bend and an underrated quality about Nolan is how good of a run defender he is. A lot of people don't realize how powerful his hands is. He can set a strong edge. And then also, I mean, he can walk guys to the back of the pocket too. He's done that plenty of times. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, he has really strong hands. So with Nolan, He's one of those players that, I mean, a lot of people are saying he's really light, but he plays much stronger than that 240 pounds. So, and Foster, you can speak to this. It's really hard um, mm -hmm. going against those guys that can bend, but also, you know, they can corner and dip and rip to <laughs> put that stress on that upfield shoulder too. So he's going to be a problem for a lot of people. Yeah, those guys that are that size, you want, you want to underestimate them. Like I remember a guy that used to give me issues was Derek Burgess. They played for the Raiders and um, the Eagle. Like, he was not that big. But, man, when I say he said that edge, he said it. And you couldn't move him. You know, and he could rush, too. Uh, you got guys like Robert Mathis. Robert was probably 240 or something like that. But, listen, he could turn that corner and come downhill, too, and bull rush you. You know what I mean? So, guys that are explosive, explosive explosiveness equals strength. You know what I mean? So you can't just you can't just look at a guy's size and tell how strong he's gonna play. Because if he's explosive, that translates to strength. And I, I know that can be a problem for guys on the edge. I think, you know, in today's game, man, Nolan's gonna be a problem for some guys. I don't think people knew he could dip how he did, 
Georgia made him set the edge a lot and made him, you know, kind of, you know, keep the integrity of the pocket a lot, you know. Uh, so I think he's going to – do you remember uh, – we talked about it before you came on. Uh, it's a guy that I really didn't like, I'll admit, um, coming out of LSU, Danielle Hunter, and because the production wasn't there. You didn't see him. Like, I'm like, man, this dude is long. He's fast. He's athletic. Why is he not getting to the QB? But we see what happened when he got to the NFL. You know, he got coached, and he was able to rush the passer. He's becoming, you know, one of the premier guys for a few years. You know, I can see that happening with Nolan. Yeah. My question on Nolan, you know, I went back and looked during the combine when he ran that, you know, Four three nine forty, I believe it was, but there's only been like twenty edges to go sub four five five at the combine in the last five six years, and like his, his run D grade, which I mean, don't get me wrong, I know PFF is is not the end all be all, and there's there's flaws in their grading system, but just comparatively, I went back and looked at his his run defense grade, and he, by far he had the highest of, of any of these these edges to to go sub four or five like that, you know, including uh, Trevon Walker last year from Georgia. How rare is it for a guy that fast and and really not that big, if we're being honest, to be able to two gap and do the things that he does in the run game? Because it feels like it's something that we just don't see very much. Yeah, it's very rare. That's the biggest question that you always have with those guys that I like to call that are DPRs, designated pass rushers, is that, yes, you can play them on third down. You can get them up the field vertically. But when teams run those gap schemes out and when they have those big pullers coming right at them, are they going to be able to hold up and set an edge? And Nolan has shown that he's very violent and he's very aggressive when he sets the edge. It's not one of those situations of where they're just trying to exist and hold up. Nolan's trying to collapse that hole that they're trying to create with those gap schemes and those pullers that they're using to attack him. So that's why I don't have any worries about him as far as a run defender. But also he's really good with using his hands too, which is very rare. And that was Daniil's biggest problem at LSU was that he had the athletic profile, but he just didn't use his hands. Like he had no idea what to do with his hands and he would just mm -hmm. experiment. It, basically he was out there freestyling. freestyling. He, it's freestyling with everything and just trying to figure out what works. But, and I think that's something Nolan still has to work on too. He, he freestyles quite a bit, but you know, with the athletic profile and then how well of a run defender he is, eventually it's going to click for him. You know what? I got to follow up something when you're talking about Nolan, but th I think you brought this up on uh, during pro day as well. I'm self-proclaimed Steeler fan. Always be a Steeler man. I won't ever stop being a Steeler man. Can Nolan convert to middle linebacker, given the speed, given the talent, given the athletic ability? Where do you see him on that next level? Could he go to the out? Will he stay on the outside? Could he bounce inside because of his overall talent? What are your thoughts on that? And that's coming from a Steeler fan. And this is why you're going to hear the Hassan Reddick comparison used with him a million times. Because if you remember, in Arizona, they tried to play him at Mike. They tried to play him at Will. And they gave up on him. They simply gave up on him. They said he can't read his keys. He can't attack downhill. And he can't diagnose what's going on in front of him. But if you allow him to put his hand in the dirt or you put him in a two-point stance and you just say, hey, pin his ears back and go attack the quarterback, that's what he does. And I think that's what Nolan does. Just watching him drop back in coverage in pro day, it didn't look natural to him. Um, that's why I think he's probably more so of a four, three, five technique. I think he's more comfortable with putting his hand in the dirt and just allowing him to get up the field and then also hold uh, the edge too. Uh, I don't really like him as a three, four outside backer, honestly, uh, just because when you do ask him to go in coverage, it just didn't look natural to him at the pro day. So I think with him, you want him to be that four, three, five technique, like a sign Reddick did with the Eagles. He goes out and he gets 19 and a half sacks his first year playing five Ooh, technique with the crazy. Eagles. So, um, I think a team will make a huge mistake if they play him on the second level as opposed to playing him in, with his hand in the dirt on the first level. Yeah, you you want to you want to take advantage of mismatches at the, at the NFL, and um, you take that away if you stack him. You know what I mean? You want to put him. You want to sit him on the edge where he has the athletic advantage against who he's playing. So I agree with that. You know, another polarizing player um, that we love, I mean, obviously, Mr. Chip Six himself, Keely Ringo. Now, we've had 
your guy up there at ESPN, Ryan Clark, on. We asked him a couple different questions about Keeley. Can he bounce back out to safety where some people think he may be better at? Uh, we've seen the ability, the athletic ability, obviously. What are your overall thoughts in, 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 regard, in regard to him in terms of how he translates to the next level? Because he's had these great games, and then he's had these games where he's kind of looked out of sorts. So what are your thoughts? So I've went back and forth with so many different people just talking about Keeley and trying to figure him out. And he's been difficult to figure out for me. Um, but I think I finally come to a consensus with myself in that he's one player where a team scheme and fit is going to be vital for him just because at Georgia, I think Kirby played him in more man coverage than what he needs to be playing in just because, and you guys know, Keeley's a straight line athlete. He's a track guy. So you always want him moving vertically. And, and if you think about it, all the picks that Keeley has had during his career, he's been carrying him vertically on vertical routes down the field. But when you ask him to change directions, test his hip mobility and move east and west, he's not going to be very good just because he's not very shifty as far as moving side to side and stop and start. And that's just not his game. But if you ask him to play cover three, carry vertically and keep his back to the sideline, I think he can be a starter for you. So if he goes somewhere like Seattle, uh, opposite of Tariq Woolen, I think that would be a good fit. The commanders will be a good fit for him. Anywhere where he can go and keep his back to the sideline and play predominantly cover three with a little bit of man coverage sprinkled in, I think Keeley can be a good player. But if you're asking him to play cover one and just lock down guys throughout the entirety of a game, that's just not who he is. So that's why I think some people have a lot of questions about him as far as him moving back to safety, which I don't agree with just because even though a player – and he's been productive, but – He's had some bad moments at corner. You can't just slide him back to safety just because exactly. it's, there's, so, there's so many different things mm -hmm. that go into playing safety. And uh, I will say this, like usually guys later on in their career, they move back as opposed to forward. Like guys like Charles Woodson and some others, they go from corner to safety as opposed to safety to corner. So uh, that may happen later on in his career. But as far as right now, if you put him in a cover three scheme, I think Keeley can be a starter for you. But if you're asking him to consistently hold up and man coverage like Kirby asked him to do in spots this year, I just think that's not going to be good for him. Who uh, I've never been able to come up with it and um, and spend much time on it. Who would be a comp for you for uh, for Keeley on the on the top end if, at, at his at his best? What do you see his ceiling as as a comp at his best? Um, the name that I had was Xavier Rhodes. Xavier Rhodes was one that um, – now, he played in predominantly cover one, but, I mean, he the Zimmer got the most out of him, but he didn't – he wasn't a great fit in Zimmer's scheme. I think it was more so of Zimmer getting the most out of him. And I didn't, like him. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't like him in that scheme. Yeah. Uh, I, I, he, got, he played kind of timid and soft in, that, in this game, you know what I mean? But I could see you talking about the athlete, the speed, the size – uh, anybody else besides Xavier? Um, that's really the one that I think is a high end comp for him. Um, that's the one that I've been rolling with anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this this question is coming from from a big fan of yours, Kay. He's actually in our in our one of our chats. Uh, yeah, Jim. Yeah, <laughs> he's asking. That's our boy. Well, no, not Jim. Kay. We talking about K in the other oh, chat. Okay, okay, okay. So he wants to know why isn't Stetson been in a first round pick if other quarterbacks <laughs> are first round pick? <laughs> We're talking about height. We're talking about two time champion. We're talking about he showed the arm strength. Why isn't he a first round pick? Um, I think it's just because of some of the limitations that he has from a talent perspective, and I think a lot of times. With fans, they struggle to differentiate <laughs> a successful college quarterback and successful NFL quarterback. There's some baseline traits that you do have to have from an NFL perspective. And, like, I think Stetson can what be – What are you talking about with Stetson specifically? Like, what traits do you feel like he's – Just just the arm strength. Um, arm strength is something that he lacks quite a bit. Um, the accuracy at times, I think he does struggle with. And, you know, Stetson was a great college quarterback. Like, he's one of the most highly decorated players in program history. But 
there is some baseline traits that you need to be successful in the league. And I think he does have those. But as far as those one, those, those ones that put you over the top to being a starter consistently, um, I just don't see that with Stetson. But if he cars out Taylor Heineke, Case Keenum, I think it can be those types, which, I mean, those guys are going to play 10, 12 plus years in the league. Yeah. They bounce yeah. around and they play forever. And it wouldn't surprise me if Stetson goes on to lead a team to the NFC title game like Case Keenum did. Like it wouldn't surprise me if he goes on a run like that, but. There's just a certain level of baseline traits that you need to be successful in the league, especially when you're talking about going against Mahomes and Bur- Burrow and Herbert and all those guys. I just don't envision Stetson putting a team over the top like that, but he can get a hot streak here and there. And like I said, he I think he's going to play in the league forever um, just because of now. And I said this yesterday on SportsCenter, like, He's not one of those quarterbacks in a controlled setting that's going to look great. Like, he's not going to wow you at a pro day. He's not going to wow you at the senior bowl practices. But when you turn the lights on and you put a ball in front of him and 22 people are out there, he's just a gamer. Like, when the lights are on, he just understands how to win games. So, uh, like I said, he, he's going to be a backup in the league forever. But I could see him getting a hot streak here. A starter goes down for the rest of the season, and he leads a team to the NFC or AFC title game or something like that. that that's 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 just crazy to fathom, though. <laughs> nobody thought, <laughs> nobody was saying yeah, yeah, this two years, two year, two oh, years ago. Like like, so uh, obviously you got a chance to see the dogs up close this year. I presume you said you went to yeah. the game or so, like. So you really – you saw NFL potential in Stetson, whether it's free agent, seven, round, like fifth, third, whatever it could be. Um, so you, you you did see NFL potential in him. Yeah, I mean, I think he's going to be a late-round pick um, just that's, because that's, the, the resume is so good. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people understand that backup quarterbacks are a vital position. Like – we're seeing guys like Garner Minshew still getting paid and uh, Case Keenum and players like that. Taylor Heineke still getting paid. And like I said, mm-hmm. it wouldn't surprise me if Stetson goes on to have a career like that. And I think he has all the traits that those guys had coming into the draft without question. Um, and if you think about it, Stetson never had a number one receiver. <laughs> at Georgia. Oh, yeah. Like he, yeah. he, he never had besides Pickens. I like Pickens a lot. Um, yeah, but he wasn't but he, there for he, the Raiders. he never yeah he never had that dominant go to guy he his top two guys were Brock Bowers and Darnell Washington like they played him a lot of twelve personnel and those really were your top two receivers so yeah I mean I like Stetson more than most I would take him you know fifth or sixth round and those late rounds I would take him there without question especially um, after those top guys there's a lack of supply Heineke was my comp too I I did Heineke when he was coming out of Old Dominion. And um, you just saw a guy with some moxie. He had a little, he, he had some. He, he went had some undrafted. It. Yeah, he went he undrafted. Some, <laughs> and he had some. He had some, that arm where he could flick it, and he could get loose too. Kaniki was a you know better court, better athlete than people gave him credit for, and uh, he could you know escape a little bit. Um, so that was a you know that was a good comp. I want to ask because I look. I know that Georgia fans are going to listen to this and they're going to they're going to get mad if I don't ask you this or one of us doesn't ask you this. So talking about Stetson's arm strength at the combine, I mean, I personally think the quarterback velocity stat is kind of a bunk stat, but like he he had the same miles an hour as Will Levis, I believe, and then his deep ball throws. I mean, I wasn't there, but accounts from people that were, it, it seemed like he was as good of a deep ball thrower as any of the quarterbacks that he threw with in his little group. What throws specifically have you seen concerns with his arm strength or is it more like the off platform type stuff that you see from some of the Mahomes and Burrow type guys that that they're able to do and maybe he isn't? It's more of the deeper stuff. When you saw it as pro day yesterday, the ball just kind of hangs in the air a little bit more than you would like. And they kind of fluttered a little bit too. He had some throws that he messed up on yesterday um, that he wanted to redo. So just watching him for the second time of close, um, I saw him the South Carolina game. And then obviously yesterday at pro day, the deep balls hang a little bit more than you would like. You would like to see him drive it 
a little bit more. So that's just the biggest question with him, just more so on the deep throws. And he, he threw it well at the combine. I think you're exactly right. But as far as the the velocity stat, and I don't really pay attention to that because all they're doing <laughs> is standing. They're just standing in front of a mat, and they just have a radar gun behind them. And they're just throwing it as hard as they can. So I don't really pay attention to the velocity stat that they have. Well, see, you know, on this show, we're 100% Gator haters. So we got, I got to revert <laughs> this thing because oh, there's a guy yeah. that's blowing up all over the place. We're part of the roll up network. They, they're Florida guys. So they're going to hear this kind of thing. AR 15, Anthony Richardson. He's like rising up the charts because he's Mike Mamula of, of, of this year's draft. <laughs> you don't put Mike but, Mamula on the game, yeah, man. I'm going I'm to say it because when you go back and you look at the tape, you look at the inconsistencies for the last few years, you're saying to yourself, well, how's this guy a potential number one overall pick? Then you go, you look at the, the, the measurables. You know, he can run as fast as lightning. He can jump over the moon. He can do all these great things. But you've seen him. What are your thoughts on, on AR-15? Um, Give it to us because, you know, our, our fans want to hear it. And they're probably going to get mad at you, but let, let's do yeah. it. Yeah, I could be here talking all day about this one just because even before the season, I was a big fan of Anthony. And mm-hmm. I'll go all the way back to I'm going to do my best to convince you guys in five minutes because <laughs> I could be here all day talking about him. Let's do it. So if you think about it, before this season, he rotated time with Emory Jones. And there were cer- there were some situations where he didn't even know if he was going to start the next series in a game. So you go into a game having no idea which series that you're going to play in a game. And then they used him a lot as a wildcat option for the most time. He only had like, I think, 66 passes or 66 plays coming into this year or something like that. Some crazy stat. Um, so I don't even count the 2021 season with him as far as him playing games just because him and Emory Jones are rotating back and forth. But the one moment that really made me a fan of AR was it was the third quarter of the LSU game. It was the one time where he got to play an entire quarter and you saw everything coming together for him. So you fast forward to this season, Billy Napier, a brand new system. Um, everything that they did was from the pistol formation. So he has a running back three yards behind him. Everything's pistol play action coming down to his right side or bootlegging left back to his right side. Pretty much every snap. There were many things where there were rare times where he was just asked to drop back. So from a media perspective, we have to figure out the why behind that. Why did they not let him do straight drop backs? That's number one. Number two, he was throwing to nobody. Ricky Pearsall was his only receiver that he had. So he had no weapons to throw to at all. They were in flux a lot of times. And then a lot of times with Anthony, with I'll say this, with Anthony, you have to run him to get him involved in the game. It's the similar way with Josh Allen of where the way they get warmed up in games is to take contact. So you have to run him at least eight to ten times a game just so he can get in the flow of the game where there's quarterback design runs, getting him out on bootlegs and let him throw to the tight ends. Just figure ways to get him outside of the pocket or figure out some ways to get him some contact. He's not a guy you want back there throwing 30 or 40 times a game just because that's just not him. But with Florida, they very rarely let him throw that many times. So it's a smaller sample size. So with that small sample size, everything is going to be magnified. That's why you see the completion percentage at 40 or 50 percent. Because he's only throwing 20 to 25 balls a game, which is not a whole bunch in a college game. But when you allow him to be that type of player, you see the athleticism. Like, he's a ridiculous level athlete. You see him doing backflips pregame and all this other stuff. Um, so you want, you want him being more involved in the quarterback run game. Um, but with Anthony, it's a projection of where you have to assume what he's going to be in the future. If you just gauge him right now, you're not going to be a fan. You're not going to be a fan of him right now. And the thing with him is that he's very detailed as far as playing the position. It's not a situation of where he's a one read and takeoff quarterback. That's your biggest worry with those athletic guys just because that's their superpower. So they're not going to go through a full field read progression just because they know when they take off, oh, I can out-athlete everybody on this field. So they kind of use that as a crutch that I like to call it. Anthony doesn't like to use that as a crutch. He only likes to run when he has to. 
So you see him going through progressions. The thing with Anthony is that his footwork is so bad, you have no idea if it's going to be accurate or if it's going to hit the first row or the bleachers. So he has to clean up the footwork aspect of it. But once again, going back to my first point, he's only played 13 games. He has not played a lot of football. So he has not seen a whole bunch of looks that he's getting. He hasn't seen a whole bunch of defensive structures that he's going to get on the next level. And that's the tricky part about his evaluation. Everybody wants to use the Mahomes blueprint of where he needs to sit a year or two and you know, then let him take over after that. The only way Anthony is going to get better is for him to be out there with those live bullets. He's not going to get better on the bench. So that's the tricky part of his evaluation. But, I mean, I like him a lot, but the tricky thing about him is that in order for him to work through all of these flaws, he's going to have to be out there and play. All right, I'm, I'm going to say this. When do you – Go ahead, George. So how do you feel about him – because the athlete's been there. We all seen the kid, you know, take off, house house a run. We've seen him throw it on a rope 50 yards. Like, nobody's discounting that. And I, I don't think anybody uh, will, 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 you know, we've all seen that, put it like that way. What do you feel about him and what have you heard about him uh, from the neck up? We heard he interviewed well. Uh, you know, we know he's off all – Oh, we know a smart kid. That's not what I'm talking about from the neck up. I'm talking about mentally, mental toughness, mental stability, and that thing on the left side of your chest. Like, where does, where does that land him? Because I think those two things are going to play a part in it because you look at his body language sometimes. You, you, you wonder if he's that competitor. You wonder if he has – the, the mental uh, toughness to bounce back from when it goes bad. Because it can go bad in the NFL. There's some really, really high-level athletes that he's going to be facing. You know what I mean? So I don't have an issue about the athlete, but um, with a lot of guys that, you know, don't pan out, is more so that thing in their chest and from the neck up. What do, you, do you think he has it all to be able to succeed in that in that area? And that's the tough part about the media side just because we never get to sit down and actually meet these guys. So we have to lean on our intel as far as talking to scouts and evaluators and everybody that I've talked to, they said his meetings went great. Like he was self-aware of why his flaws were bad, where he went wrong. He was able to successfully explain some of the interceptions that he had. And then also some of the good plays that he had. They said he was great on the whiteboard. It wasn't a situation of where he seemed simulated or scripted. As far as, you know, agents or representatives putting him so, through the car wash that I like to call um, and preparing him for those answers. They said he was very authentic with everything that he went through. Um, and, you know, just based on the sources that I've talked to, they said he's very sharp and self-aware of the good and the bad that happened with him. Self-awareness is key in life in general. <laughs> See, you didn't have to convince me. I, I was really throwing out the Mike Mamola thing because everybody always knows. You know, there's all, always one guy that outperforms everybody, and, and someone's always going to be prepared, uh, compared back to Mike Mamola back in the day, obviously. For those who don't know, he was a workout warrior, rose up to a first-round pick. But I, I am. I'm a believer in AR. I think that if he gets to the right system, the right coach, the right development, he can be one of those guys that takes that jump. Um, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be uh, vastly interesting. Um so we talked about Georgia. We talked about a Florida guy. Anybody else that, I mean, since you cover the SEC, I mean, you cover all these guys. Is there anybody that we're not thinking of that you believe, whether it's on Georgia's team or anybody else's team, that can make this splash that you just say, you know what? I don't think anybody's looking at this guy. That's a really good question. Um, I wouldn't say nobody's looking at him. Uh, he's a player I do like, though, that didn't perform super well at the Combine, but I think he's just a gamer, and that's Christopher Smith, the safety at Georgia. An older guy, very experienced. Everybody that you talk to, talking to Keeley prior to um, the uh, the pro day, and then some other guys, some younger guys that were there, they just praised his leadership so much. And even though he ran in the high four fives at the Combine, when you turn on the tape, his game speed is unbelievable. Like, seeing him play – that true traditional free safety role, which is very rare for today's day and age, is really hard to find reliable one-high safeties as far as being able to come down and tackle 
Um, and then also being able to hold up in coverage is very rare to find those type of guys. Not saying he's rare as far as the talent, but as far as just the complete package, as far as um, having both as opposed to an either or situation. Sometimes you get a lot of guys that can hold up in that single high defense playing on the roof of the defense that I like to call it being a mistake eraser on the back end and pass coverage or they're better. As far as coming downhill and run support, I think Christopher Smith is a combination of both. And then also what's going to help him a lot is that he played on every single special teams unit. And I think especially as a young DB, you have to do that walking through the door. The more hats that you can wear, the better, especially being a rookie. So it wouldn't surprise me if he goes like third or fourth round and then he ends up being a starter like halfway through his rookie season. Nice. Nice. <laughs> That's good for him. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, Jordan, we know you're busy. I mean, you, you're a man that wears very many hats right now. You're blowing up all over the place. What's next for you? We want to give you a chance to plug yourself, plug ESPN, plug all your efforts so that people can see and hear more from you and about you. Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter at Jordan underscore Reed. That's J-O-R-D-A-N underscore R-E-I-D. Um, I have a seven-round mock draft, all 259 picks coming out. Um I believe it's March 29th. Yeah, March 29th is coming out then. Um, I'll be doing Alabama, Kentucky, and then also Florida Pro Days for SEC Network. So you can find me there. Well, you know what? Before you go, give me a quick one. Now give, just give me a quick one. Pittsburgh Steelers, who do they take? And what do they need to take? Offensive line, I would like them. I would like to see him take offensive line. I would love to see him take Broderick Jones. <laughs> I think he would Give be a good fit for him. I think Broderick would be a good fit for him. Corner, I still think they need help at corner. Um, Joey Porter Jr., Deontay Banks, any of those names would be really good for him. So offensive line, corner, and then I think they need a true inside linebacker too. I think they're really lacking some speed along the interior. So um, a, a Mike linebacker would be a really good pick for him too. Nice, nice. <laughs> I'm always impressed with you cats that could do a seven round mock drafts. <laughs> y'all, y'all been getting a lot it of work, in. man. Y'all a lot been of getting work. it in to know that many <laughs> things. <laughs> That's impressive. I'm looking. When, when do you say it's going to drop, or do you know yet? Uh, March 29th. Gotcha. Great. Uh, March 29th. We will be there. And I tell you what, be on the lookout. We got a special show. It's going to be uh, when George talks about his times of when he was playing against Deacon Jones. He was talking about guys that can't make the <laughs> <laughs> They can't bend, but Deacon Jones gave it to him. But no, nah, Jordan, thank you for joining the show. We really appreciate it. Um, you, are, you are welcome anytime, but you are one of the best that's out there doing it. And uh, we continue, uh, we praise your efforts and, and just hope you can, you know, continue to grow. Absolutely. Thank you, guys, as always. All hey, right. man, I appreciate you, man. I really do. Thanks. No problem. I'll be in touch. All right. Well, fellas, I mean, that was Jordan. That's great. Reed, <clears throat> excellent information, man. I mean, he knows his stuff. I was, I'm all, I've already been a big fan, but, I mean, coming on live and, and, and him breaking down what he saw and what he's – and and what the dogs actually had to offer makes me an even bigger fan. What are any of your takeaways from anything that he said? Anything that he mentioned? Oh. I like yeah, Christopher I mean, Smith. I yeah, I thought I like that answer a lot as well. Um, it's hard to ask these guys about all the Georgia guys, you, you know, when they come on because there's there's like a dozen of them, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, like we didn't even talk about Kenny Mack and some of these other dudes, but yeah. Darnell, right? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I thought it was it was interesting. Um, I felt like he had perhaps the most like well uh, reasoned and like properly measured take I've heard on Anthony Richardson mm -hmm. this draft season. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's mm -hmm. either been like. He's the next Josh Allen, or he's garbage sauce, and the truth is usually somewhere in between. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I thought he did a good job of kind of laying out both the the things that are exciting about him and and the questions that remain. Only the only place where I was kind of in disagreement. I don't know if you throw him out there right now. I oh, think, I know. I, I, I don't think sitting will hurt him. You know, yeah, he's got to learn. He, you, you definitely learn by playing, but. Day one, I don't know about that. I mean, I think he'd have to have a phenomenal quarterback coach <laughs> and an offensive yeah. system that allows him to, one, make the mistakes without hurting you too much. 
I mean, I'll be, I'll be almost kind of like, I hate to say it because I'm a Steeler guy, but the Steelers, I mean, they, they kind of play that, that good defense, stabilizing defense, Baltimore, right, that allows you to stay in games and yet make mistakes offensively where it doesn't kill you because your defense is so good. Uh, San Francisco, places like that. But, yeah, I, I don't agree with that as, as well. I mean, throwing him out there to the Wolves, still having the bad footwork, possibly bad reads, um, using his body more than what he should. I mean, that's enough to get you killed in the NFL. I mean, George, you know about that. These guys, are he's big and he's fast, but there's guys out there that are just as big, just as fast. Heck, Nolan ran the same speed, if not faster. And, and you know, those guys are going to clean your clock. So, um, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with throwing him out there right away, but I do think he can make the adjustment. He's definitely, he's definitely a, an athlete. You know, the package, the package is – that's a big kid, yeah. With a ho- yeah. with a hose, with a hose. Oh, yeah. So you know what I mean. It'd be interesting yeah. to see. I think you know the way and the way uh, offenses are nowadays. Um, you know, it's the the era of the statue is over with. You mm-hmm. know what I mean. So pockets move. You know, quarterbacks move. You know, intentionally they move intentionally move the pockets. You know, to get guys open that way. You know what I mean? So, you know, he, if you look at the package, he fits today's game perfectly. You know what I mean? He doesn't have to be Drew Bledsoe. You know what I mean? So, um, we'll see. We'll, well, Graham, we'll see. you brought it up. I mean, you brought up the guys that we didn't get a chance to talk about, and I would have loved to have talked about it, you know, the Kenny Max and everybody else. But what are your thoughts? I mean, because Kenny Mack is another guy, in my opinion, that can actually help a team a lot. In terms of his yeah. ability to be able to catch out of the backfield, he's not your prototypical four four guy. He's you know he's not running. Heck, he didn't even run a low four five. He's up to what four six? I think he ran overall. What are your thoughts? And George, you were there at pro day. Uh, what did you see out of him, or maybe what some scouts maybe he heard through the grapevine about his ability? Uh, man, I'll say this on Kenny Mack, and then I'll clear the way for George because because he was there for the workout, but. What says the most to me about Kenny Mack of, of, of anything is a, the, a stat that I came across. So there's been three guys in the SEC since, since 2000 that have had, I believe it was uh, 800 rushing yards, 500 receiving yards, and 10-plus touchdowns in a season. Percy Harvin, Dexter McCluster, Kenny McIntosh. He, he's versatile. He's a weapon. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, his pass protection has come so far in his career. Mm-hmm. That used to be something that, that I knocked him for early on and thought might keep him off the field at times. And I always go back to the 2021 national title game when that game was tight and Georgia needed a drive in the late third quarter, early fourth quarter. Kenny Mack was lined up playing slot receiver. You know, I, I think mm-hmm. that says a lot about just how good a route runner he is. So. Um, I, I think he just brings tremendous value and versatility to anybody that would draft him. Listen, listen, I'm, I've, I've, it can, it's, it's well documented. I've been a fan of the guy. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember when he got there, but probably for the most part since he's been there, he was my favorite back out of Zeus, out of Cook, out of all, out of all of them. He was my favorite back on the roster. Just because I saw he's not don't have the long speed the long speed, but he was explosive. He caught the ball really well. Um, he always moved forward. You know what I mean? I just he was just a really complete back, and uh, I'm, I've always been a fan. You know, smooth athlete. And like I said, he he you know he's not gonna wow you in the workout setting. I didn't see anything you know special at the at the uh, pro day workout from him, and uh. I wouldn't care <laughs> if I was a if I was a, a GM or or a head coach or running back coach. I wouldn't care at all, you know, because the guy is productive and he's just a football player. You know yeah. what I mean? He's a football player. At the end of the day, you want as many football players on your team as you can get, and um, he's he's gonna help. He's gonna help somebody. Yeah, man. Um, before we tap um, Graham's brain here on what's going on already in the first couple of days of, of uh, spring camp, George, I got a quick question. Now that pro days are, are over, you got 
combine that's over. What are guys doing? What are, I mean, I know that they're, they're taking their interviews. They're flying all across the, the country. But what are they doing and what should they be doing? Because you have wisdom. You have knowledge about this process and what can keep these guys out of trouble, et cetera, et cetera. They should be keeping their nose clean, you know, not getting in any trouble, anything to, you know, it's still a lot of time. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's, uh, the draft is around the corner. But it's still a lot of time for things to go awry, you know, if you don't take yeah. care of your business. Um, you want to keep working on, your, you know, how you present yourself to these teams. Uh, a lot of these prospects are going to be part of the team's top 30 visits. You know, you got to walk in that building. You got to be prepared for to be your best self. That's your resume. You know, mm-hmm. part of your re- the majority of your resume is already – turned in via your tape and then a little bit more with the combine if you were able to go then a tad bit more pro day and the last part you know if you get chosen to go on a visit you know I think I went on four maybe Um, if you get a chance to go on a visit um, you got to show like we you know teams take a lot from those visits you know what I mean to get a guy in the building to see how he interacts with coaches to see how he is on the on the whiteboard to see how he is just with the people in general you know they're going to ask they're going to ask the you know the runners how was he on the on the ride from the airport they're going to ask that you know mm-hmm. what i mean and i've heard you know uh this guy was a, a douche you know i've heard that before mm-hmm. you know they're gonna they wanna know that they wanna know the whole person because that's what you're dealing with, you know, the whole person. And uh they should obviously be staying in some type of shape. You know, like I mentioned before with Jalen, you know, and there's no telling what he's been going through. Probably a lot of stressful, you know, uh probably not a lot of, you know, training the last couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. You know, if I if I if I had to just be honest with you, I can't see a scenario where he was just getting after it for the last couple of weeks, last two, three weeks. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so that, that probably had an effect on him. You know what I mean? That don't mean he's a bad, you know, going to be a bad player or anything or a risk. It's just it's just the fact that it matter. Well, you want to stay on top of your, you know, stay on top of your fitness and all that stuff, you know, because, listen, you got, I don't know the rules and stuff now, but a lot of people are going to have OTAs, you know, you got to have mini camps coming up and, you know, mm-hmm. that's literally around the corner. You know what I mean? That's going to be, you know, not too long after you're drafted. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, just want to stay on top of your stuff. It's, it's a bu- it's business now. You ain't got no class. You ain't got none of that stuff. Your job is going to be to be the best football player you could be. Nice. So they gotta, you got to prepare themselves for that. Nice. Well, we hope these guys stay safe, you know, safe travels and everything else. Um, keep your nose clean. Heck, if it was me, man, all I'd do is work out, eat, work out, mm-hmm. eat, and go to sleep. That's all I would do because you've got a, mm-hmm. you're a walking lottery ticket and anything can happen to you and everybody. There's always some type of predator out there trying to take advantage of these guys. So stay clean, fellas, um, and as always, go dogs. But, Graham, I want to switch it over to you because that was last year. Our guys are going to the NFL, but camp has started. I think we're two days, three days in. You have any intel, man? You got anything to share? Or anything that you're hearing out there on that field that uh, might move the might move the needle in terms of what the listeners listen to? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the, this time of year, there's always a lot of interest in the early enrollee guys. Heard a lot of good things about. Um, Damon Wilson and Samuel and Pimba, you know, mm-hmm. pair of five-star edges. Those guys definitely look the part. And then uh, a whole lot of excitement around our guy, A.J. Harris, you know, one time 100 Sanford guest, five-star defensive back out of Alabama. Um, I, You know, I think there's a chance he's going to – he could push to play right away. Um, you know, you got Lasker <laughs> there who's obviously a good experience and, and Everett was kind of the – First guy off the bench last year, but um, he might be too good to to keep off the field entirely. You know, you may see him rotate or um, be in 
in certain six DB packages and whatnot. And then uh, the big question is the quarterback battle, right, which we've talked about before. And, uh, I mean, I think the, the big takeaway for me has just been don't sleep on Gunnar Stockton. Um, it's early in spring practice. You know, we haven't even seen a, a, a real full padded practice yet, but that's, that's been the refrain throughout this off season is just hearing about how much the staff loves Stockton and, and the work ethic and, you know, his knowledge of the offense and people feeling like he just kind of has that it factor um, where he's a guy that people like to follow and he gets people excited about what what he might do in his career at Georgia, but he's got two really talented uh, upperclassmen in that room with him as well. So I think that battle is going to be fascinating, and I, I feel more and more every day like it's it could stretch into the season, especially with Georgia's uh, relatively easy out-of-conference schedule this year. Um, I, you know, I think they might end up throwing those guys – out on the field and, and just seeing what they do in live action. But, um, yeah, man, I mean, it, there's a lot to be excited about, obviously, for, for all Georgia fans. Yeah, I think it's interesting what, what Kirby brought up. I mean, I know that the initial reports were, uh, from what Kirby had mentioned, that uh, Beck and um, – Brock Vandergriff were going to, you know, share snaps as, as the number one so far. And then you had Gunner obviously coming coming up. But I thought it was interesting from that standpoint of the fans probably want to see Beck. I think Brock was one of those guys where people were kind of iffy on because of some throws that he made whenever he got into the game or maybe he didn't look the part. And then you got the wild card gunner where I think a lot of people are just excited about because they, I don't think he, that we've had that type of quarterback or he reminds them more of Bennett, you know, the, the, the gunslinger, the charismatic uh, quarterback, uh, the guy that, you know, captivates a room. And we've heard that going back to his high school days and he just captivates the room, right? He captivates a community. Um, so it's going to be interesting, uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the challenge of, of what's going to happen. I'm also looking forward to the progression of this wide receiver room. I know, George, you brought that up in terms of being there and seeing B-Mac, but when you look at the at, at Pro Day, there were two guys out there catching the rock. It was, you know, Rosamie Jack Saint, but Dylan Bell, if you go back and look at the highlights of Pro Day, his mm -hmm. footwork, his, his, his route running – is elite elite. I mean, I'm, I'm interested to see what he does as well. And so, and what happens coming out of camp because this wide receiver room, I think is going to be deadly, just absolutely deadly. Yeah. Um, listen, yeah, yeah, I, I know, I know it's a lot of pressure, but we really don't have any excuses. You know what I mean? It is what it is. You know, once you, once you yeah. climb the mountain, you, you know, <laughs> You got to do what it is to stay there, and they got they got everything. Yeah. They don't know who that QB is going to be, but they got enough QBs to <laughs> to do what they need to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting. Uh, I know I know a lot of people like Gunner. He's a winner, man. The man is in the record books in Georgia. There's been a lot of great quarterbacks come through Georgia, Georgia High School, rather. Right, you know what I mean. So, you know, and he's in the record books. You know, you know, and, and that record book been around a long time. And you know, so he's he's done some great things. He just has that it factor. So it's going. And even Kirby has said, you know, don't count him out in this thing. That's you know, you know, I, you got to kind of over the years you kind of learn to read Kirby. <laughs> you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. He'll give you he'll, he'll give you he'll give you little nuggets here and there, you know. He's never gonna, you know, you know. That's why when when he's all in on somebody, you you know you know it, <laughs> right? You know it, right. And, and 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 you hear it, and there's no you know, there's no if ands or buts about it. But sometimes he throws you little nuggets here and there, you know. He's kind of like he's like putting us on notice that you know. It's it's not just a two man race, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. he, had, he had he had to throw that in there a little bit, just you know, just in case you thought it, just in case you thought it was a two man race. He had to throw, he had to give you a little nugget to tell you that, mm -hmm. hey, 
this is not really a two man race. <laughs> but we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, it's gonna look like that <laughs> in this yeah. media. What you got, well, Graham? You over here cackling, man? What you got, bro? Oh no, I wasn't. I was just laughing at George. Oh, <laughs> like, George is my guy. But um, nah, man. I mean, let's talk about Jalen Carter real quick because by the time this this uh, goes out, this article will have published, and people will probably be like. <laughs> Why didn't they talk about this? Um, Let's do it. So, I, you know, Jalen Carter's attorney released a statement today saying that, that Carter uh, pled no contest to misdemeanor traffic offenses of reckless driving and racing. Uh, the, those both occurred in the hours after, uh, or, you know, that, that happened in conjunction with the accident on the night of January 15th. Uh, the, the big thing that I have is, you know, his, his statement today, there was a, a paragraph in, in the attorney's statement that said, Mr. Carter never left the scene of the accident without being told that he could leave. He stopped his car immediately after the accident occurred and ran towards the wrecked vehicle while his passenger called 911. Even after being informed that he could leave, Mr. Carter returned to the scene at the request of the athens Clark County Police Department to answer additional questions and continue to cooperate throughout the investigation. So, mm. uh, man, that con- that contradicted reports previously uh, that had come out that said that uh, Jalen, you know, left the scene before any police or medical personnel arrived, or at least called them into question. Um, there was a article that came out by the Atlanta Journal Constitution today where uh, they said they contacted the attorney and he said that he was not uh, he was not combating any of their previous reporting. And so I, I was kind of confused by that because it seemed like by nature the statement did contradict some of their previous reporting. So uh, I just called the guy up and, and he was nice enough to, to speak with me for a little while. Um, and so here's some of the, the quotes that he told me. Uh, he said, you know, I asked him specifically if, if Jalen left the scene of the accident before any law enforcement or medical personnel arrived. And he said that his understanding was that Jalen was still there when uh, first responders came to the scene. Um, he said that uh, the idea that he fled the scene is unsupported by anything I saw in my review of the case. Now the case is over. Everything related to the investigation is subject to an open records request. There shouldn't be any question to what happened. He did not leave the scene until he was told he could leave the scene by law enforcement or some other third party with authority told him he could leave. Uh, He says, my information from the police reports and video is he was told he could leave. He left. Before he was able to get home, he was called and asked to return. He returned, gave an interview to the investigators, and gave them the phone number of his passenger, the passenger interviewed with police the next morning. Um, I also mentioned, you know, the, these reports that Carter at the scene have, have kind of led to some people speculating that maybe he was under the influence of something that evening. And he said, uh, when you see the videos from, you know, that night, I guess I'm assuming the, the body cam videos and stuff from the police, uh, that you'll see the investigator is right within a foot of his face. He says they would have charged him with a DUI or done more investigating if he smelled like alcohol or had any signs of being under the influence. Um, So a pretty emphatic uh, statement by the attorney. Um, The other thing that that I thought was was quite interesting was, uh, you know, I I asked him um, about basically that, you know, there was there was some question of whether, you know, there there was this idea that his, uh, his interview or whatever, uh, or that his, you know, his statement, uh, didn't combat the reporting. And and I asked him about that directly. And he said, uh, specifically that like he, he had never read, uh, the reporting by the Atlanta journal constitution and that Mm -hmm. he had told them that he cannot combat something that he hadn't, he didn't know what the report said, so he couldn't combat it, but that anything that's, that's in his statement, basically, um, you know, if, if it's contradictory to what was previously reported, then in that sense, he is, he is disagreeing with the previous reports. So, uh, 
kind of just interesting how, you know, words and things get moved around and twisted and all of that. But, uh, it, you know, it's a pretty emphatic uh, statement by, by the attorney, Mr. Stevens, um, to say that, you know, Jalen did not flee the scene of the accident as once said in the media. Well, the shame, I mean, that's, that's great, uh, great reporting by you. Uh, excellent work of contacting and finding out the information as, as well uh, with Jalen's attorney. But th the sad thing about it is the narrative that's created. Here's a kid that's, you know, at the combine, getting ready to do interviews. He's about to go before millions of people um, live on the NFL network, and this report comes out. It's a shame that, that that type of narrative can be created because then from there, then you start seeing – you know, him tumble down the, the, uh, the rabbit hole, so to speak, going from a number one pick, possibly overall, to stumbling all the way down to what some people may think uh, as low as is, is 20, 25, just based upon anything else that happens. or And even now with the, the pro day workouts where it being lackluster of, of what people thought he was going to come out and look like, uh, it's just it's unfortunate. Uh, I know, George, I know you've seen it being a, being a scout, being on the pro level, seeing guys have their reputation tar tarnished because of some type of report. But it's unfortunate with a guy like this because he is that talented. And from all accounts that we have ever received for out of Athens and players, he's nothing but a class act. So um, it, it's it's unfortunate. Truly. Yeah, it is. But, you know, I'm I'm always hopeful that truths come out before – before it's too late, you yeah. know what I mean? So um, I'm glad this stuff is, you know, coming out and, and some of the negative stuff is being refuted. Um, but, but it's good to hear for, for yeah. the kid. Yeah. Excellent work again, Graham. Appreciate you bringing that on to the show. Yeah. Um, and if you're listening, please make sure you go to dogcentral.com, subscribe, become a, become a member Excellent work that's there. You get all the updates from Graham, uh, from Field Street Forum in terms of recruiting, all the updated information that comes there. Nobody's doing it better than Dogs, uh, Dog Central. Nobody. So um, make sure you subscribe. Um, fellas, before we get up out of here, just one last thing. Who you got winning the national championship for basketball? Cinderella is out right now. I mean, it, it's, I it, they're going to work. I got Texas. You got Texas. Nice. Uh, I don't know much about the field this year. I'm going to say Bama. Boo. <laughs> Bama went to work just a few minutes ago, man. I got Houston winning it in Houston. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. Yeah, man. I, I think it's going to be interesting. But I, I can also say it's fixed. I mean, when you look at that Midwest region, you got Texas A&M, Texas, and Houston. I mean, all of those teams can kind of get it done. I mean, obviously, Texas and Houston can get it done, number one and number three seed. Texas A&M a seven seed. But it's like they tried to set it up that there was at least one big dog coming out of that region that was going to play in Houston. And it's only just now. I wish I was there. You know, just moved out of there about a year ago. But I would have went to the, uh, to the game, man. I mean, I lived literally three blocks away from the stadium. But um, hmm. it's going to be interesting, man. It's gonna, they're going to be partying down there in Houston. But next year... National championship is down there at Reliance Stadium anyway. Yes, Let's go get it done because I got places to stay. I got places to go, places to eat, know all the people in the city. So uh, we can have a good time when we get down let's, there. Let's, let's, let's meet up down there and, and have a turkey leg, man, on me. Hey, man, I'm, I'm at the turkey turkey leg hut. I think somebody told me it closed down. I got I to gotta double check on that. I don't know what's going on. I got to double check on that, though. Mm -hmm. But I heard I got some – I got a bad report on that. So I'll, I'll let you know. I'll text you and let you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, fellas. Any last words before we get out of here? Uh, no, man. Go dogs. All right. As usual. Go dogs. See you at 100 Sanford. Go dogs. You. Thank you for listening to the 100 Sanford Podcast. Tune in weekly to hear fresh content from the 100 Sanford Podcast every Thursday, but also with some pop-up shows every now and then as news breaks. You can also follow the content on our website, www.100sanfordpodcast.com, and email us at dogs at 100sanfordpodcast.com. Lastly, reach out to us on social media streams. For Twitter, it's at 100 Sanford, but on IG, TikTok, Facebook, and other accounts, it's 100 Sanford Podcast. 
All right, folks, that's it. And as usual, see you at 100 Sample.